Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at FunkinStuff.net and on YouTube, Truth and Rhythm can now also be enjoyed on the go in its podcast edition from FunkinStuff.net and iTunes. I'm your host, Scott, Dr. GX Goldfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the first guy to funk, get your copy from Amazon. Whether you're watching or listening, I thank you very much for your interest and your support. My guests today are drummer Raymond Calhoun and keyboardist and horn player Oliver Scott. These largely unheralded musicians, composers, and background singers were literally and figuratively instrumental in many of the Gap Band's great albums and songs during their run as one of the most popular funk and soul groups of the late 70s and through the 1980s. Their work can be heard on classic hits that include, I Don't Believe You Want to Get Up and Dance, Outstanding, You Dropped a Bomb on Me, Burn Rubber, Early in the Morning, Humpin', Party Train, and Yearning for Your Love. Several of those tracks and their albums reached number one and sold millions. They notched six straight top albums, or six straight top six albums on the US R&B charts. That is unbelievable. The credit of fame and riches that came with massive success, however, was for the most part limited to the three Wilson brothers, Charlie, Ronnie, and Robert. They were the only ones pictured on the album covers and key collaborators and contributors like Raymond and Oliver were not officially recognized as full-fledged members of the Gap Band. They were relegated basically being hired hands despite participating at a level usually associated with greater recognition. Ironically, for the past several years, they've been the ones keeping the legacy alive the most by bringing those unforgettable songs to the people and touring as a Gap Band experience. Just ahead, we'll find out more about Raymond and Oliver, how they hooked up with the Wilson Brothers, what went into creating those hit albums and songs, what their lives were like during the Gap Band's heyday, why and how the band declined and disbanded, the frustrations and hardships of not being recognized as an official band member, and how they continue to put the music first. Raymond. Great to have you with us. Thank yeah. you. Great to be here. And so, Raymond's out in uh, Los Angeles, I think. And then we've got Oliver out in Houston. Oliver, welcome. Thank you, Scott. Good to be with you, man. Thanks for taking interest in the band, man. We're really trying to get it together. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So pleased and grateful to have you both uh, with the show today. And, um, you know, are you ready to dive in with some questions and tell the people what's up? Yes, sir. Let's do this, sure. man. <laughs> should be interesting. <laughs> so I want to start from, you know, pre-Gap Band uh, to get us rolling. You know, could you tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, where each of you grew up and how you first got into music and then lead that up to, you know, when you became part of the Gap Band. So we'll start uh, with Raymond first. Uh, I, I'm from uh, originally from Washington, D.C. Uh uh, and real quick, I, I, I guess I kind of got my start working with the Manhattans. You know who the Manhattans are. Manhattans for about two years in 70, uh, 77. And then uh, after that, I uh, played drums with Peaches and Herb uh, during that, you know, Shake Your Groove thing, reunited years or whatever. But after that, I moved to Ohio and met this girl and married her and was hanging around doing nothing. And a couple of friends of mine mentioned to me, hey, the Gap Band's playing up in Indianapolis, Indiana, and they might be a percussionist slash drummer percussionist, or more or less percussionist, mainly, because they had a rock star playing drums with him uh, at the time. And so I went up there, and one thing led to another. I met them backstage, gave them my phone number, and said I was a percussionist. And thought that they would never call me. About two, about two or three weeks later, they did call me, and I came out to L.A. and auditioned for the band, uh, playing percussion. And... Uh, Kind of the rest is what it is, you know. From there, I 
started touring with them, and me and Ronnie Kaufman were playing drums and both playing drums and percussion. We used, we switched off and did the same thing on the records, you know, switched off the records in the studio and all of that. I, I met the brothers mainly myself. So, Raymond, before I switch to Oliver's story, um, you know, did you have some musical heroes that inspired your playing uh, early on? Yeah, you know, the typical guys. I came from a jazz background initially. Um, Tony Williams, Lenny White, Jack D. Jeanette, Elvin, all those kind of cats. You know, growing up, I was in the real, I was pretty heavy in the fusion, you know, and uh, that's kind of what my beginnings were, you know, uh, growing up in Washington and stuff, you know. I wasn't into that go go thing, you know. I, I, I had a little minute playing with Chuck Brown when I was in high school, but I, I couldn't feel that. So I wanted to play jazz. So yeah, my biggest influence are like all the top jazz drummers, you know. Dennis Chambers and me actually grew up together. I don't know if you know who he is. But uh because he's from Baltimore and I'm from DC, we knew each other from back there. We about the same age. And uh yeah, the jazz guys are pretty much my influence. Good enough. Oliver, going to turn over to you. So tell me about your story a little bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, my story is, you know, I grew up in a musical family in a traditional Pentecostal uh, church, Black Pentecostal church. And my mom and dad, 13 kids, I'm the 12th of 13 children. And all of my older brothers and sisters either sang or, or tinkled or played on some instrument. And we always had a piano in the house. My mom kind of read from the hymn though she was our church musician so i grew up around music uh, my earliest influences that i remember the first song i actually learned how to play was hello josephine by fats domino i was probably you know i'm talking about as a song i used to tinkle on the piano but i actually don't thought that 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 learned fats song and, and then vocally i guess my influences early on were crazy Rambling Rose by, by Nat King Cole. Rambling Rose, Rambling Rose, are you rambling? No one knows. I mean, that was my first, some of my earliest influences, but then the church as well. And so, of course, James Cleveland, Aretha Franklin, uh, uh, Shirley Caesar, those influences because my parents were very involved with the church. And so, as I grew up, got in high school band, learned to play trombone, kind of broadened my understanding of music by learning some, you know, marching band music, some concert music, some, you know, classical, traditional stuff. And then after getting out of high school, moved out to California, you know, had started doing a nightclub scene in, the, in, in a small town called Waco, Texas. It's, it's, that's where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And everybody, when you say Waco, they say, first thing they say is David Koresh, who was like, he came in from Southern California. So the Bruce Flakes and Nuts brought it in. And now, you know, Waco's kind of known for him. But we had some uh, pretty gifted folk come out of there, too, as well. Uh, uh, Steve Martin and uh, another guitar player I went to high school with. I can't remember his name right now, but he did the uh, theme to Arthur. I can't remember his last name. Anyway, he, we graduated the same year. But out of high school, went to California, did some nightclub, chilling, circuit gigs, moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is where the Gap Band is from. My oldest brother was there. He'd been a, a journeyman musician there for years and uh, was staying with him and two of my other brothers. And I met the Gap Band, uh, saw them downtown playing once. I had never, I'd heard of them, but uh, didn't, had never heard of them. I saw them downtown playing and I was just totally just flabbergasted by their, you know, just their, the funk, man, and their, their instinct for what to do and when to do it. And so I didn't meet them that day, I just heard them. At that time, Ronnie Robert and Charlie were all in the band, of course. They had a couple of drummers and Jimmy Maker, uh, God rest his soul. He was in the band at the time. And so I, that's the first time I heard them. So after being in Tulsa a while, of course, they're the most popular band in the area. They moved to Los Angeles. And the night they were leaving, moving to Los Angeles, my brothers and I, we had a group called Bloodline. They came by the club and they had heard about us. And they walked in the club and heard us playing. They were like, wow, man, you guys are funky. And they hung out with us about 30, 45 minutes. And then they went to LA. Uh, about a month later, we decided, you know, if the Gap Band's going to L.A., we're going to L.A. And so we moved to L.A. And uh, 
after going to school a couple of years out there at City College in Los Angeles, one of the best music programs in the area for community college, uh, learned some theory. And my brother, one of my brothers, went by the Gap Band's rehearsal. They had, by now, they had been with a couple of different managers, a couple of different record labels after I'd been in L.A. for like a year, year and a half or so. Uh, my brother went by the club they were rehearsing at and heard them, found out they were looking for a trombone player. And uh, he came home, he came, when he got home, he called me and said, hey, man, Oliver, man, Gap Band is in town. You know, they're looking for a trombone player. And I played trombone, you know, in the stage band at school. So the next day, I went by the rehearsal audition. They had already hired a guy, supposedly. But because I could play trombone and sing and play the little keyboards, they didn't know that at the time, they hired me over the guy that they were already thinking about taking. So that, this was in 1979. And I rehearsed with them for the next few weeks. And we did, the first date I did with them was in Chicago, Illinois. And I remember very clearly, I was 24. Uh, they put us up. We did it. We did a concert, at, some outdoor concert at some college. I don't know the school. But we got there. They put us up. I had a room by myself at the Hyatt Regency. You can imagine a country boy from Waco, Texas, being at the Hyatt Regency, looking down on uh, the Hudson River and Michigan Avenue in Chicago, Illinois, on the 24th, you know, 25th floor, and looking out that window, and I said, yeah, this is the life I want. And so that's kind of was my first gig with the band. And after that, you know, uh, kind of stayed with them. I finished up my schooling. That was in May. Finished up that semester and uh, kept rehearsing when we went out on the road. That was my first year going on the road with 1979. Wow. So, um, Raymond, did you join a little bit before Oliver, or did you guys know each other at all before that? Or what's the sequence in terms of you know who joined when, and when were you both together in the band? No, Oliver was in the band before me. He was actually on that tour with them. Right, that first year. When I uh, when I got in the band, I was kind of like, to be honest with you, I was probably the last guy that got in the band because uh, everybody else was there. Ronnie Kaufman. Jimmy Macon, um, um, you'd be heard. Was Billy in the band then? He wasn't there yet. Billy didn't come until later. Right. Billy kind of came after you. Mm -hmm. uh, and Romy kind of came after you. But yeah, I, I, you know, I came, when I came in the band, Oliver was already there. He was already MD, MD playing trombone, keyboard, yeah. singing. And yeah, and that, the thing is, that was the very first year I went out working with them. So that was the first year of their, that their popularity actually started. So, you know, even though I got in the band before Raymond, it was only a few months. We were on the, my first tour. I got in the band that first tour. Billy got in the band that first tour. Jimmy was already in the band. And so Ronnie Kaufman was already in the band. And I think Fred Jenkins came on that first tour when we threw Chicago. We picked up Fred. Yeah, we picked up. No, Fred came a little later. Remember? A little bit later. Okay, okay. We had Nightingale and we had Booney playing guitar. Right. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Boom Doxatron, MZ Park, rest in peace. You know, we had, we had a couple of guys in the band now. I don't know if you know this guy uh, that passed on, Jimmy Macon. We want to acknowledge them. MZ Parker, Hubie Heard. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so <clears throat> they were pretty pretty influential in terms of the feel and everything on those records. Yeah. So how big, how many pieces were in the band in total? Like about eight or ten? Uh, it was always a big band. It was always a pretty big band. I, just, let me think. We had three horns that first year I went out. Myself, Ronnie, and a guy on sax. I forget who the guy was. But then the Ferguson. You know what? Dino Vice. Dino Vice was playing trumpet too. So, and then of course a full rhythm section, two guitars, Robert Wilson, rest his soul, on bass, and then Ronnie and Charlie out front, Charlie playing some keys, and we always we had a second keyboard player as well. So it was always 10, 11, sometimes 12 pieces. Later on we had background singers. So early on, though, it was at least 10, you know, nine, ten, maybe eleven guys in the band. Wow. That's like a full like review, you know? Yeah. Big cast. <laughs> kind of like George Clinton. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But still, still today like George Clinton. I just saw him a few couple weeks ago in Charlotte. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the specific albums and, and tracks. Okay. 
um, that first album, The Gap Man, came out in 79. And I remember, you know, hearing Shake on the radio and picking up that record. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I love the uh, that walking bass, you know, and singing at the end of yeah. that. I mean, that was yeah. too, too cool. Um, and then it also had on that record, uh, Open Up Your Mind Wide was another pretty cool track. So looking at the credits for that one, um, I don't think I saw Oliver on there, but I, I saw somebody by the name of Moon Calhoun. Is that is that another name for Raymond, or what's the story there? No, actually, Moon is um, pre pre Gap Band's success in terms of before yeah. they had their success. Moon Calhoun, his name is Rick Calhoun, mm -hmm. amazing drummer, amazing vocalist, amazing writer. Yeah. He wrote uh, Stay for Shaka Khan. Just a great guy. He was the drummer along with Stay Wright. They were there before me and Ronnie Kaufman, pre-Gap Band success uh, when they came out of Tulsa. Gus, he could yeah. Right. He that band a, that I saw, that band that I saw downtown that day, Moon and Cedric were the drummers that day when I first saw them live. Moon was the, actually the drummer. He and said they had two drums at the time. So yeah, that was pre me, pre Calhoun. That was the uh, like the local gap band, regional gap band, gap band before their success, like Calhoun said. Right. Uh, after Shake Your Boogie is when kind of all of the albums went yeah. went on to their success, uh, and then at that point we were a part of all of that. But Moon was there uh, before all of us. And uh, it's tragic about him. He's such a great person. Uh, you know, he was paralyzed in a bicycle accident, a freak bicycle accident. Yeah. He paralyzed from the neck down. He hit a bump in the road with his bicycle and hit the back of it and, and it paralyzed him. So he's paralyzed and it's unbelievable. He's still writing and everything in his little studio at home. And, and but it's just so tragic that a, such a talented guy like that that uh, that something like that would have happened to him. Yeah. Where where are the odds though? So the successor has the same last name at the same wow. instant. That that it's always been freaky. Yeah, let me let me mention go back a little bit too about Shake Your Booty, which uh, I don't even know until all of this, but this is the truth, man. When before I even met the Gap Band, and I I, I heard that record on the radio. Because that they were black, playing at the depth, shake your booty, that the booty, that. and I actually that was like one of my favorite songs, and I kept saying, "Man, you know what? I want to play with that band." Yeah, wow, that's crazy. Myself, I said, "I want to play with that band." So that was kind of one of the reasons why I went to Cincinnati with my buddy. Uh, my I have a buddy named James James Carter who played drums with Teddy Pendergrass. He's a good friend of mine. Him. I went to see him. He said, man, that band, you know, that song you like, they're going to be playing with us in Cincinnati. So come on up to the show, man, and get in the show. And when I went to the show, I went basically to see him and to hear the Gap Band playing that song. And then so just so happened that I got backstage to meet Bobby Eaton, you know, Robert Whitfield. Uh, uh, and those guys were the ones that told me about saying that Charlie and Ronnie might be looking for percussions. And that's how that led to me driving to Indianapolis and all of that, but that's that's crazy how that that whole sequence of things happened. But that, I used to love that song. I used to be like, damn, that basically I used to love the whole bop, da, 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 da. That's yeah. one of the main things yeah. I remembered about the song, you know, the Robert's Robert's bass solo and all of that. It, it was kind of like the Sugarfoot thing, but on a bass, you know, right. what, what Sugar used to do. Yeah, With the power players, exactly. I mean, it yeah. was, but uh, anyway, that. Uh, so that's that, something coincidences or fate you know it's like you be the judge yeah yeah it's kind of weird you Cal, when you talk about fate jimmy macon first time i saw jimmy macon was in my hometown of waco jimmy who was with a different band that came out of dallas he and another guy wilma raglan raglan ended up playing trumpet with the gap band for a year or so maybe a couple years uh i saw them when i was a high in high school you know, a part of a band from Dallas and had no idea that at some point when I saw Jimmy with the Gap Band, I was like, I've never seen this guy before. He was a part of a band that came out of Dallas called, at the time they were called the All-Stars. I think they 
later changed her name to something else. Conspiracy. Conspiracy, exactly. Jimmy was with that band. Man, you're talking about a funky band. And when Ronnie and Robin and Charlie saw Jimmy, he was playing with Conspiracy. And it's really something how, you know, even at, in high school, I met guys, I saw guys play that eventually I ended up playing with in the Gap Band. Kind of like similar to Calhoun's story, like hearing it and saying, man, I want to play with that band. I didn't say that, but it's really kind of ironic how I ended up being in a band with folk that I'd seen and was like, wow, these guys are cold. I mean, they were the best band I'd ever seen live until I saw the Gap Band. And they were really at the same level. It was a great band, man. Those guys were gifted. Uh, the Patrick Brothers out of Dallas. Caden and Lord's no JLNG, man. I saw these guys, they were 16, 17 years old. Sound like mature professional musicians, but never really got the platform to show their their, their skills and gifts. And uh, But Jimmy moved on and transitioned to the Gal Band. And then later, Wilma Raglan, who was with uh, the, the conspiracy, played trumpet and sang. He later on became a part of the Gal Band's horn section. So it's really kind of ironic how those circles run over time. You end up doing stuff. And uh, like you say, either providence or coincidence. <laughs> It's like yeah. that, that six okay. degrees of separation people talked about. You know, not the, 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 it, I'm just trying to show you real quick um, of, of some of the some of the talent that was always surrounded by the Wilson yeah. brothers. Wilma Raglan, he actually wrote one of Gladys Knight's biggest songs. You're number yeah. one in my in my book. He actually ended up writing that song. You're number yeah. one yeah. in my book. Yeah, a lot of good guys. Yeah. A lot of gifted guys in that, that associated with that band. <clears throat> I, fi I find it also interesting, though, you know, from a, a sound perspective, you know, Shake and then on the second record, Stepping Out, those seem to have more of like an Earth, Wind & Fire-ish type of vibe. And then, you know, Oops, Upside Your Head came out, had a little more of a P-Funk kind of vibe. And then they seem to kind of go more in that direction as time went on. You know, what do you all remember about how the sound sort of evolved? Uh, let's uh, throw that out to Oliver first. Well, with Shake, it was more, I mean, with Shake, you hear kind of the churchy funk feel. It's not funk in the hardcore parliament kind of a sense of it, but more of an R&B funk. But with Shake and messing with my mind, yeah, you're right. You do hear that the horns and the, the kind of style of the Earth, Wind & Fire kind of influence, but then you also hear the, the vocal stuff uh, that's more R&B, gospel oriented. And like, you're right, with Oops Upside the Head, I think the band started to toy with, you know, the parliament kind of like playful funk and uh, started to kind of move in that direction more so because of, I think Robert really was, was really intrigued by that. And Charlie started to do more of the kind of characters, you know, like Star Child. Charlie started to go in, he didn't change his name, but you know, he didn't have characters to go with him, but the way he did Oops was, you know, kind of rapish, kind of storytelling. Jack and Jill went up the hill, just kind of playful, fun stuff. And so that kind of started with Oops. Uh, but then I think the next step with with with, with the, the third album, Gap 3, kind of solidified really a, a kind of a... a, a meshing of all of those things together because you you have a little of that that playful stuff with humping but then you got a, a classic r&b ballad like yearning that was the third single but the first single burn rubber was more traditional r&b so it wasn't a parliament funk stuff but it was r&b funk and then it came out with humping which was the kind of more playful stuff didn't have the kind of success but you start to see all those ingredients start to come together you know and and, and really kind of showcase that there's just basically a lot of diversity, a lot of things that the band could do. I mean, Charlie and them were, were you know, they got one of the first big breaks was being the band for Leon Russell, who was not an R&B guy. They were his band, but he just loved their, their ability to interpret a, a multiplicity of different kinds of songs. And so I think it's, it kind of to, you know, from Gap 3 on, I think you just see a, just a smorgasbord of stuff that the band could do. Because Charlie was such a great singer. And then the, uh, the Wilson brothers were very gifted. And then they had all these gifted musicians around. So you just kind of get, you know, a, not a solidifying of their identity, but it just kind of saying we can do whatever we need to do in order for 
people to get the messages that we want to, to send, you know, and how, how we, they need to feel to hear it, we're going to produce that feel. You know, sometimes that's the boys are back in town, which is kind of a country and western thing, and sometimes that's a funky, you got me humping thing, you know. So I think the band was just so versatile, it was really kind of hard without clear direction from one single person to just kind of hem us into one style. And so we just got labeled a funk band, but we could do a lot of stuff. Yeah, actually, um, well, a couple points. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that there were actually two Gap Band albums that preceded that one that had Shake on it. I didn't find that out until much later myself. You know, there was one like during the early 70s, and then there was one um, maybe a couple years before that album. I think it was maybe also called Gap Band One or something like that, and they kind of almost had a reboot, uh, although it was different material uh, with the album that had Shake on it. But, I mean, they were knocking around for a while before they really got hit on radio. Um, and then you talked about the versatility. To me, I think um, you could really see their uh, facility with ballads beginning on that second record too, because um, uh, No Hiding Place, you know, was a good mellow track. Yeah. So um, Raymond, what do you remember about sort of that transition from kind of the, the Hornsy Earth, Wind and Fire thing to get a little more of a P-Funk feel and just being more versatile in general? And you know how how what role did your drumming play in all that? Uh, when, when I so when I came in the band, it was it was like Oliver was saying, kind of earth, wind, and fireish, uh, P funk influence because you know they worked and toured with George Clinton and you know uh, uh, Rick James and that kind of thing was there, and uh, you know I was kind of like I was a percussionist really. I played more than percussion in the beginning. And then when we started, I started getting involved in the recording end of it. It's kind of like, uh, you know, they found out I could play drums. So Charlie and then would let me play drums on some of the records and let Ronnie Carpenter play drums on some of the records. So yeah. I ended up playing more uh, on some of the stuff that was, I want to say kind of, kind of East Coast flavored drumming. Like humping was like an East yeah. Coast feel. Uh, burn rubber. I played drums on burn rubber. That was that feel that uh, that I basically kind of just emulated from listening to George Clinton. That's the, if you listen to the feels of George Clinton. So that's kind of where I went with it with that. Uh, but yeah, you know, um, I think the biggest influence in the band uh, in terms of other groups were probably Earth, Wind and Fire, George Clinton, uh, Rick James, um, Stevie, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, we, and we, like, like Gussie said, we had so many gifted and different type of players in the band. Like, I didn't play like Ronnie Kaufman. He didn't play like me. But Ronnie ended up playing on one of their biggest records, Drop the Bomb. So he had his feel. For drop the bomb, and he played on all of his record yearning. So, you know, he had his feel for stuff, and I had my feel for stuff for playing drums, along with a couple of other drummers that were mentioned on some of the records, like Melvin Webb, Rest His Soul. He was another drummer that played on some of this album. Uh, James Gadson, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I mean, it's just. A, so many different flavors of players and styles that went into the Gaps music. Who who played uh, who played the drums on um, early in the morning? Ronnie Kaufman. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Ronnie was Ronnie was a guy. You know, he was a young guy. Uh, Ronnie and I went to uh, LACC together, and I kind of you know in, introduced him to the band. And he came to rehearsal. And he wasn't a polished drummer, but he was, you know, he had a good ear for picking up stuff. He was young and hungry. And Ronnie, Ronnie and Charlie saw, I think, in him this 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 ability to mold him, mold him. You know, Raymond had a lot of experience. You know, he named some of the groups he had played with back back east and some of the influences he had. And so he kind of had an idea of how he wanted to be as a drummer, which I think served to, you know, give Ronnie a little more opportunities, even though. You know, you start talking about who's the better drummer. That's always subjective. 
But I think Ronnie, uh, Charlie saw in Ronnie Kaufman, this young guy that they could mold into the Gap Band's drama, more so than they did Rainbow, but it's really kind of how it turned out. You know, you listen to the live recording of the Gap Band live and funky, that's Raymond, <laughs> you know? So it's, it wasn't that Raymond couldn't do any other things that were being done with Ronnie. I think that their perception was, hey, here's a young guy, I can mold him in what I want to be, and then I can use Raymond for stuff you know, that I want him to, you know, give his flavor on. And, and eventually, like I said, I mean, Raymond, after years, ended up being the guy that, to me, that live album really captures what the Gap Band was really about, man. That was, that's, that's one of the most powerful records that I think they've ever done because it captures their energy and the fire. And then I didn't get to play on it, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but, you know, like, <laughs> even back in the day when we toured with two drummers, we kind of like fed off each other's feet. Exactly. We, I mean, at times we used to play exactly the same time. Yeah. You know, so he's had two drummers playing. It. They, it, you know, it goes back to their past with Cedric and Lou. They yep. always had this thing about wanting that. Charlie always had this thing about wanting to have a bigger sound with the drums, so he would have two drummers playing. Yeah. It. So, you know, that James Brown thing, you know what I'm saying? Yep. So, um, but that we, you know, we played off each other, and sometimes I switch off and play drums and play, and he play percussion and uh, bike and back and forth, and we yeah. did that for a lot of years, you know what I'm saying? And then when we got to the studio, we did the same thing. You know, he played drums on this song, I played percussion. He played percussion on this song, I played drums. You know, so that's how I, you know, but we were always listening to each other's, you know, feel and feels, mm -hmm. uh, feel, and we always listen to each other's feel. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And we kind of influenced each other, you know what I'm saying, me and Ronnie Carl. Yeah. yeah. All right, so Oliver talked about um, the third album where things really started to coalesce and, and the public responded, radio responded. That record, um, <clears throat> Burn Rubber, um, with its synth bass groove, to me was heavily influenced by, um, we talked about um, Parliament, but I think specifically Bernie Worrell uh, yeah. and that sound from Flashlight. I mean, the Gap Band kind of took that and made, you know, a mint out of it. And I mean, they really um, took it to, to different places, um, which was very cool because, I mean, that was just such a breakthrough record it, it itself. But it set, set sort of a template for the decade to me, you know, when you had um, the succession of Burn Rubber and Early in the Morning and um, Dropped a Bomb and some of the other ones. But also the mellow yearning for your love, I think you mentioned already on that album, was a, a great, great uh, ballad. Um, and, um, you know, what stands out to you about that period when it kind of went to a, a new level of success and that sound just gelled and the public responded? I'm sure the crowds got bigger. Um, and did you expect Burn Rubber to hit as hard as it did? So let's uh, go to Raymond for some reaction on that. Um, you know, personally, I, I always thought I had my favorite songs of the Gap Band that I like, you know, and, and uh, of course, Oliver's song, Yearning, was always one of my favorites in terms of their ballads, more so than No Hiding Place or any of those other ones. His song was kind of the staple of the ballad of the Gap Band. Uh, Burn Rubber, <clears throat> you know, I remember when we were recording that song, <laughs> Charlie, the way we used to record is like this, man, we would go in the studio, and Charlie would then just run the tape, Michael run the tape, and it would, it would always like start with a beat first, and then Charlie would jump on the mini move. That's Charlie playing mini move bass on Burn yeah. Rubber. Actually, Charlie played mini move bass on a lot of the Gap Band hits. All of that stuff, really. Yeah. You know, most of the, most of those hit, most of the records, he played bass keyboard. Of the dance records, he played keyboard bass on. Yeah, Charlie playing keyboard on Burn Rubber and uh, uh, I early think, in the morning. I think uh, uh, early in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, party train. You know, I think that's Charlie playing keyboard bass on that stuff. And mm -hmm. so he would, you know, we start with the drums. If I either if I play a drums or write a coffin or whatever, we start with the beat. And then he would start playing a keyboard bass part. And we just run the tape, man, over and over. All right, start again. We didn't play with no click tracks back in those days. So we didn't right. That's right. It was just straight running the tape and just playing the grooves. 
and Charlie would play keyboard bass. I remember one instance of, for example, we were on the road and we were traveling and we found this little hole in the wall ass studio down yeah. in Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, Charlie said, we want to record. And we went in there and we started recording in this little raggedy studio. And that's where we came up with humping. Uh, and we were in there trying to fix the equipment to make it playable so we could record. And I remember, I remember, he, he example that I remember when we was doing humping, I was trying to put tape on the, drum, <laughs> on the kick drum because it was broke and they ain't have another kick drum here. So I'm down there taping the drum and Charlie, man, 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 all right, Charlie, you ready? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it, it, you know that was like a mistake, and he kept the shit. And that's <laughs> you know, it's like I'm trying to take the drum head. He's like, "All right, can I get ready?" And I'm like, "Oh uh, yeah." You know, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. He had quirky stuff like that that ended up becoming like magic in these songs. Yeah, yeah. that was like some of the magic. And then we took that tape and brought it back to California, and then boom, we just. It just Took it and just you know made it what it was, but we used yeah. the original two track or whatever it was, yeah. and we recorded in this little studio, man. So, and it was like that on all of the songs. I mean, you know, it's it's always some kind of magic that was always involved in those gathering yeah. songs. Yeah, yeah, I remember that that particular trip to Calhoun because we recorded about that little studio. I mean, yeah, it was an eight Bernie track studio, it was studio. Eight, Bernie in Nashville, Tennessee. We were remember in Bernie? He was the bus driver. Yeah, it was a little eight. Yeah, Bernice, the lady that the drove. Yeah, she she told us about her. it. Yeah, it was an eight track studio we recorded. Huh? We, we I know we we did a, a eight track recording of "Yearning for Your Love." We did a couple of other songs too. But when we got back, we knew that we had a couple of songs that were definitely going to be on the next record. I know "Humping" was one of them, and "Yearning for Your Love" was on one of them. We actually re-recorded "Yearning for Your Love." But everybody heard it there, just the music. There was no no words, no lyrics. We just played the, the track. And then we got back to L.A. and we recorded it. And like you say, the magic, man, it happened. I think that, that, that Gap 3 album, I think we had started to have fun with the music. We had started to, guys who were in their mid to late 20s, I think Ronnie might have been the oldest guy in the band. But guys were really like, yeah, this is the situation that you know, I've been training for since I started playing, and this is a situation where I can start to express myself freely in this, in this, and, and kind of having fun with writing and being in the studio, kind of living the dream in some ways and a nightmare in other ways. <laughs> I guess we'll talk about that later. But but the music, you broke me. <laughs> it was fun then. Though. We were having fun. Well, we enjoyed recording. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you were on Total Experience Records, or at least the Gap Band was signed to to that label. Um, Lonnie Simmons, uh, I think, was running that. So who was really leading the production in the studio? Was it Charlie? Did Lonnie have involvement? How did how did that work? Yeah, uh, you know, in the studio, everybody knew Lonnie was the boss, even though musically. And his in intuition about music was very limited. I think in some ways, the basic kinds of recordings that we came out in their success, you could attribute to some of his limited musical insight because he, you know, just had us, he could only go so far with what he wanted and, and basically would hear it and say, yeah, that's it. As opposed to having the idea like musicians, we know what we want going in. I think he just had so much giftedness around him that you could say, yeah, to anything the guys was playing. <laughs> but I think everybody knew he was the, the buck stop with him. But I think in another way, what one of the biggest things, and you know, you just gotta live with it that made that man successful was not just the funk and the musicians and the grooves, but Charlie Wilson has an amazing voice. And that's just, I mean, you just can't get around that. He, you know, turned what were maybe simple stuff that had nothing when he put his voice on it, it just it, like it came to life, you know. And that's one of the things that's why, as a solo artist, he's been able to have the kind of success he's had. It's because he has an amazing sound. He has a great gift. God gave him a great gift vocally. And so I think, in addition to the fact that, yeah, you knew Lonnie was the boss, he was the producer. But, of course, there was input from Ronnie. Of course, there was input from Charlie in the studio. 
there were nights when all of us were there. And then there were times when just Lonnie and the brothers were there. So I'm sure they made decisions that, you know, sometimes musically you listen and say, man, why they do that? <laughs> and then other times you say, wow, I wouldn't know when that happened. That's great. And, but, you know, go ahead, Calvin, go ahead. I want to speak on some unsung heroes too, though. Yeah, yeah. Some of the unsung heroes in that whole total experience sound, one in particular, is a guy named Rudy Taylor. Rudy Taylor. I knew that's where you were going. Yeah. Rudy was quirky as hell. All he was was like our sound engineer. He'd be when be we'd be in the studio working on grooves or whatever, you Rudy would be in the control room just coming up with uh, ideas vocally, yeah. Yeah. yeah, conceptually for songs. Yeah. And believe it or not, his name is on a lot of the biggest gap band records. That's right, man. Rudy Rudy was to Charlie like what Bundini Brown was to Muhammad Ali. He Muhammad was kind of Ali. like that. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of like, yeah, you can do anything, man. Yeah, sing this right here, Charlie. Sing yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, sing this just because it's on the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> His name was on those records because of that contribution. And a lot of people don't understand that that boy contributed a ton. Oh, man. It's a concept. To the Gap Band, yeah, his energy. How, how did he get involved in the first place? He was Lonnie's. He was Lonnie's uh, henchman. Oh, not Lonnie's henchman. He was Lonnie's boy. He was kind of like a son to Lonnie, really. Yeah, he really was. He was like he did anything. He started from the clubs, you know, Toast Prince nightclub. He was the guy running the club with Lonnie, and he would do go get Lonnie's lunch. And you, you, you name it, Rudy was doing it for Lonnie. You know, kind like a valet. Like his everything guy. Rudy was his everything guy. Yeah, Doc. He'd make it happen. Rudy was a make it happen guy. If Lonnie wanted it, Rudy would go and try to make Rudy it happen. Rudy would try to make it happen. And and uh and uh and he and then he didn't Lonnie let him be the same way when we were in the studio. Yeah, he gave him room to be creative and man, he gave you're right, he contributed a lot of little a lot uh, of little quirky stuff. Burn rubber. You know the 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 the, the the boom, 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 you hear on burn rubber? That's actually a Volkswagen. Yep. <laughs> that um, Rudy went out and cranked up and railed the engine. I don't remember. The Volkswagen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so you know, it was a lot of guys that really Big D on shake. I mean, I've heard the, I've heard the stories about Big D and some of the, the lyrics he contributed on shake. His name didn't appear on it. Well, I understand, you know, he came up with some of those, you know, key lines in Shake Your Booty. You know, mm -hmm. uh, wasn't D Gene Washington, played in the yeah. NFL, was Charlie's kind of security guy for a while, loved those guys, kind of was like with Charlie, like Rudy was with Lonnie, would do whatever Charlie wanted to make it happen. But he's a big guy, D big D was 6'4", 6'5", 230, just a big, played in the NFL, great guy, but he, another one of those unsung heroes. And they, those guys have passed on now, Rudy and him both, you know. Well, it's interesting that something like Rudy could work out like it did because it could have gone the other way too. You know, you could get this guy that was maybe working for Lonnie and was coming in with these ideas and you guys might have been like, you know, what is it with this guy? So yeah. I, I think it sounds like you were lucky that this yeah. Rudy brought such, you know, a unique yeah. uh, element to the whole scene. No, man, I'll tell you something, man. We... There was no ever no hater aid going on back in those days. Yeah, yeah. We all contributed and, and respected everybody's contribution, mm -hmm. no matter who it was. When you were in that studio, it was like we were one family. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you were downstairs in the studio, or you were upstairs playing Super Mario on the machine. <laughs> you know, eating pizza or whatever, and nobody's getting paid, of course. You're right. You just kind of doing it because you love doing it. Of of trying to make this music happen, man. That's kind of how it went. 